keeping us on schedule, I feel like I need to kind of crack the whip and ask everyone who's standing in the aisle, Park Shaw, Dr. McKee, <laughs> get you all uh, interested so we can begin the, the next uh, session, which I think it takes on a really important uh, topic. And I'll, uh, I'll set this up by explaining a, an exciting program that is new to Atlas this year, uh, thanks to the, the John Templeton Foundation, which has been a very generous sponsor of a lot of aspects of our, of our work. Um, the, the program that we started this year is a, a two-year grant program called uh, Liberating Asian Enterprise. And it has us um, funding some of our partners in the region so they can do very concise empirical studies about real ways that uh, reform can be implemented, regulations that should be done away with, uh, subsidies that should be eliminated. Uh, this builds on some work that we've been doing um, with a, another group, um, the Center for Public Policy Research in India, uh, training groups to do more research of, of that flavor, um, so that in addition to a lot of the great work that's being done to educate people more broadly about the, the principles of liberty, that we also complement that with really serious uh, research uh, that can um, move conversations. So. Some of what that project entails is us uh, getting funds downstream to some of the partners that can make a difference on the ground. Um, but then we also challenged uh, some of them to come up with a proposal to do focus groups and surveys to better understand how we can be marketing our message. Uh, there are a few examples I'm aware of in our movement to study this in a really methodical way, but I think most of the time, um, Atlas itself and its partners are using our own intuitions and we've got instincts about how to present uh, the ideas that we favor. And, um, and I think in our hearts we know that we're sort of a quirky bunch that come together at Mount Pelham Society meetings and, and here we, we don't know exactly what's resonating out in the marketplace. So uh, we were able to give some, some rather modest grants to uh, five different partners, three of whom you see on, on stage, that have undertaken this project of uh, trying to gauge how they can be better at uh, positioning the messages that they favor um, it, uh, and present in their work. Um, as uh, Tom said, the, the bios are uh, presented very nicely, thanks to our friends at Lion Rock who put together the materials here for our, our meeting, so I won't belabor them, and I'll just ask um, our three presenters to come up in, in this order. We're going to hear from Trisha Yeo, um, who you know is from Ideas, from Malaysia, the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. Then we're going to hear from Kong Min Wen, uh, who uh, has an organization called Doi Moi. He runs Atlas's uh, Vietnamese outreach platform. And then Casey Lartigue, who is an Atlas uh, Network fellow, who, who works within um, an organization called Freedom Factory in South Korea. Each of them are going to tell you about the, uh, the studies that they've done to try to figure out how we can better communicate our message so it resonates in Asian countries. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Brad. Um, as mentioned, I'm Trisha from Malaysia. And uh, what you may not know about me is that despite, um, apart from also being a champion for freedom and liberty, I actually used to work for a market research agency, so doing this bit of research was um, really coming home to me, and uh, I've done a lot of qualitative and quantitative research in the past, uh, so I was really interested in doing uh, this particular project. Um, so we call it Effective Messaging for Liberal Ideas, and I'm just going to go through the slides with you, if this clicker works. Where do I point this to? <laughs> All right. Um, so this is the structure of what I'm going to go through. We're just going to take a very few minutes because I think the rest of the time we all want to be more interactive. Um, just a bit about ideas, what's happening in Malaysia that has lent itself to the results of the research project, um, the project itself, some of the findings and analysis, and what actually impact uh, this will have on our work. So um, ideas is Malaysia's only think tank that promotes free market ideas and liber libertarian values. Uh, we're independent, not-for-profit. Um, it's really difficult to maintain independence in Malaysia's very highly politicized environment. So uh, one example is that the opposition people would actually call ideas as being too pro-government, and the pro-government people would call us as being too pro-opposition. So get, that gives you a good idea of how uh, you know we've tried and succeeded very much in taking that, that middle path. Uh, our principles stand on rule of law, limited governments, free markets, individual liberty and responsibility, things that all of you here will already be familiar with. 
Um, okay, so some of the context in Malaysia. So we have a very, very centralized government, even though we are a federalism by name. Uh, this is not really done in practice. So the Prime Minister's office in the department takes a lot of responsibility for economic planning and development in the country. Um, the Malaysian society itself is very, very used to handouts, largely because of a pro Bumiputra policy, which is an affirmative action uh, based on ethnicity. Still one of the few countries in the world that exercises that. Um, because of this, the government has tried very much to, say, reduce subsidies, reduce handouts, but this is very difficult because the country is so highly dependent on it. And we're also in the midst of negotiating the highly controversial TPPA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And um, in the past, the US-Malaysia Free Trade Agreement also broke down because of protests from uh, the people. Um, so yeah, I talked a little bit about number one and number two. Uh, number three, so the term liberalism is always often viewed as uh, an imposition of Western values. Um, this comes uh, at a time where there are movements, say, in the Israeli-Palestinian region. And as you know, Malaysia is a 60% Muslim population. So there are sort of um, global trends that are taking place, which we also cannot avoid. Uh, but so when we use the term liberal, sometimes that links very much to Western values. Um, there's strong opposition against free trade pacts. I already mentioned some of them earlier. So this project um, was focused on targeted groups. Um, obviously, we didn't have enough funds to go to, to all Malaysians around the country, so we only looked at those we felt were opinion shapers and opinion makers, uh, namely politicians, academics, and we tried to do some in the media, but um, as you know, Malaysia has been sort of ridden with uh, MH370 and MH17 uh, you know, tragedies this year, and the media has been really busy. We weren't able to talk to them in a real and meaningful manner. So we had um, several group discussions, and the reason we had to segment them into the Malays and the non-Malay market uh, was simply because of what I mentioned earlier, the fact that the Malays do receive affirmative action, and so by talking to them separately, we would get more honest feedback. Um, so you can see some of the discussions uh, that were going on in our office itself. So the objective of the project was to gauge awareness and perceptions towards liberal ideas and determine the most and least effective words for communicating liberal ideas, um, specifically with regard to the free market. Um, so I'll just go through some of the very interesting things that we found. So when we asked, what do you think of ideas, mainly because ideas represent these values, uh, some of the, the, the positive things were like independence, ability to comment freely, um, they knew about our ideology, the fact that we had libertarian ideas, free markets, but there were also a list of very negative things, like um, being snobbish, an elitist male, uh, drives a Jaguar. <laughs> um, that, that's, uh, that's actually because the president of ideas does drive a Jaguar, so obviously they know who we are. <laughs> you know? um, not uh, an idealistic child, not with the masses, um, and does not interact with the young enough. So this was just very, um, top of the head, you know, recall, what do you think of when I say the word ideas to you? Um, the response to the term free market, capitalism, and free trade, this is highly summarized, so if you have any questions about how we went about it, I can respond later. But basically, these were the very immediate responses that we got from this, this uh, group of people. And if I may highlight, the people that we got from our focus groups are very high level, so they were being very honest with us, and they were speaking to us as friends. Um, the... Slightly positive, neutral terms were uh, business, you know, it depends on the type of free market discussed. But largely, as you can see, most of the circles were, like, were actually red and, and a little bit more negative. So uh, terms like, like evil actually came out, um, that they fair, politically scary, taboo in Malaysia, um, needs control, and so on, as you can read. So the immediate terms were, were more negative, but there was a difference between the Malay and the non-Malay audience. So free markets more palatable to the non-Malay market. Uh, so people who are the Chinese minority, uh, mainly because I think the Chinese have been forced to engage in private business making in order to survive in the country, whereas uh, many times the Malay majority would um, have the opportunities that are given by government. Um, and uh, many of them recognize the divide between ideology 
uh, theoretical and as well as what happens in reality in practical terms. Um, the negativity is due to some of these things. We had really in-depth discussions you know, over the several hours that we spoke. And uh, this is just a summary of some of the reasons that they themselves gave as to why there are negative perceptions towards those terms. Uh, for example, um, they talked about injustice, uh, inequality, um, historical baggage, um, cronyism and corruption, privatization and the association with the word liberalism. Uh, now I will emphasize cronyism and corruption because out of our own history in Malaysia, where as you know, the former Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir uh, went very much in this phase of privatization, uh, following Thatcher and Reagan, but unfortunately, the implementation of that um, was not quite the true manner of privatization as we would like it to be. So what happened was instead of privatizing many of the public services, uh, they became corporatized to a select few people. And these are the examples that academics and intellectuals in Malaysia often refer to. Uh, in, in that sense, the term privatization has become sullied, uh, like it or not. So as the conversations uh, went on, many of them eventually felt that, yes, actually the philosophy behind free market, the philosophy behind uh, libertarianism is something that they might agree with, um, but not necessarily the terms themselves, themselves that we had uh, initiated. So these are some examples that they gave, uh, perhaps free competition, property rights, markets, trade, liberalization, deregulation, and so on. Um, as you can see, using the term markets or market-based or pro-markets are a lot more acceptable than using the term free market. And I'll come to that later because it actually affects upon how we sell ourselves. Uh, trade property rights are also all right. Um, so a bit of analysis. So the terms of capitalism have become tainted. Uh, this is just purely based on, on the focus groups that we did. And they agreed that the principles themselves may be something that they accept, uh, but it's the way it has been played out in Malaysia that they do not necessarily agree with. Um, okay, let's just move to that. Yeah. So these are the terms, just a summary of some primary words and supplementary words that we found throughout the interview sessions that can be used. And finally, how does this impact upon us? Um, I think one thing that was quite striking across the groups was that um, the perception that they had of people who promote free market and libertarian values <coughs> is that sometimes we are rather dogmatic and theoretical in the way that we are unmoving from our positions. So in terms of ideas work, uh, we do believe that we would not necessarily change the way, uh, not necessarily change the philosophy and the thinking behind it, but the manner in which we engage with the people we want to reach out to, uh, that may have to alter slightly. So meaning showing openness and willingness to engage and discuss these ideological differences. Um, some of them mentioned being able to cater to Islamic philosophy, where Islamic philosophy actually does encourage the free exchange of goods and ideas and avoiding taboo words. And finally, um, to have good, solid research back with data. So that, that's the sum, I think, of, of my presentation. But the question that I'd like to pose to, to us as proponents of uh, free market and, and capitalism in Asia or, or in other parts of the world is this. So after having done this, uh, we had an internal discussion amongst ourselves. And we asked ourselves the question, do we actually change the terminology of what we use, or do we actually educate the public as to the actual non muddy non study term, you know, without the baggage, without the historical influences? Um, an example would be religion. So if people were to misunderstand, say, Christianity, or if people were to misunderstand um, um, Islam or, or, or Jesus, does that then mean you change the word Islam itself or change Christianity itself? Or do you spend the bulk of your time and your effort educating the public as to what uh, truly Christianity should be or as to what truly Islam should be? 
And I think this is a, it's a really difficult um, point for us. We are still talking about it. On the one hand, some of us believe that yes, if we are going to sell these ideas, we should be able to listen to what the needs and demands are out there. So we, we should change some of the, the wordings. Perhaps we could talk about market and, and competition and opportunity as opposed to free market. Um, but does it mean that we actually stop using the term free market? And, and this is a question that I'd like to pose for us all um, as we get into the discussion. Thank you. I will invite Min to uh, give a presentation. on Vietnamese media perception on the machine of uh, gravity. Uh, <coughs> uh, the topic to be discussed here, the con context and uh, how it we uh, uh, connect the focus group and the Vietnamese uh, media perception of the media, uh, the message of gravity to level a public acceptance towards the selected words uh, and message, the factor affecting Vietnamese journalists uh, level of confidence and uh, some lesson learned from doing this uh, research. <coughs> so, uh, so context, uh, the, the reform process in Vietnam has been driven by the experimentation, not by coherent free market uh, ideology, uh, lack of unbiased information on free market idea, the concept of uh, free markets has not been understood strongly or used widely by the media and the public. Uh, and as you know, before 2008, uh, the, uh, few Vietnamese knew about the uh, well-known uh, market-friendly uh, economies like a mist or uh, high X. If someone uh, mentioned to uh, meet a treatment, they assume him as a monetarist uh, economist rather than a leader of free market economy. Uh, in order to promote the liberal idea in the country, it is important to learn what language and what words are best to you to talk about the free market in a way that people uh, are most likely to, to listen. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, we need a focal group uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to, f to find uh, uh, this. Uh, the participant, why media uh, worker and journalist were chosen to be the participant of the focal group? because media play a very important role in shaping public opinion. Now, whether or not notion of the free market is understood and accepted by the public depends heavily on whether it is accepted by show in the media who inform the public on a random issue. As Mr. Hay has said, in the, uh, mentioned in the intellectual and social, socialism, mm -hmm. the second, uh, second idea in idea. <coughs> The two main uh, research questions include what words and what message should be used to talk about the free market so Vietnamese media worker will be comfortable with them and so the Vietnamese people like, uh, will be likely to listen. What are the factors that uh, set the perception as well as the employment such a term? Just uh, Methodology. In an attempt, in an attempt to answer the research question, we conducted the survey on 100 individuals who are working actively in the field of media in Vietnam. Uh, the group is selected randomly from each of the following media segment: print newspaper, online newspaper, broadcasting company, and uh, uh, radio station. 
yeah. the method of uh, digital structure questionnaire is used to carry out this research. Uh, the research is processed by external data analysis and statistics software. <coughs> Uh, in the questionnaire, we, uh, we give the 11 words message about uh, liberty, uh, private enterprise, market economy, free trade, free market, individual liberty, freedom of choice, capitalism, rule of law, private ownership, market, uh, morality, property rights. The question. <laughs> How do we evaluate a certain level of this term in public? Uh, do you feel confident use, using this term in your article or daily conversation at work? Where is your first encounter with the perception of free enterprise? Uh, we also give the uh, multi choice answer. Now I'm, uh, I'm going to take a quick look at the characteristics of the focus group. Uh, you can see from, oh, sorry. And, and you can see from the chart that the majority of, the, of those who took part in the focus group as journalists under 40 years old, the ratio between male and female is relatively balanced. All of the participants has been enrolled in high, higher education. 89% obtained a bachelor degree. It implies that all the participants belong to the queer education social group, and they are they are expected to have more access to the knowledge as well as information. Now, the uh, uh, illustrate that most. Even if, uh, most, most university degree which the participants obtain are journalists uh, and economists, it can be understood that nearly one third of the interviewee are assumed to have knowledge of uh, economics. Now, this slide so the the OK field of the partic participant to ensure implementation of a trending sampling methodology, the selected group is composed equity of the four main sessions in the Namib media field, print, newspaper, online newspaper, and television and radio. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, Vietnamese media perception of the message of liberty. The graph shows that the majority of journalists want to know the concept of free market, mainly through the university and through the other sources of information such as book and internet. Um, the chart shows that most of journalists graduate in journalists or foreign language come into knowing the concept of free market through many sources of book and internet, besides the journalists who graduate in economics have come into the, come across this concept at the university. Now, and I'd like to move on to the uh, level of public acceptance towards the selected word and message. This just shows the journalist perception with regard to the public acceptance of the selected word message of liberty, uh, as you can see from that, uh, the words that are mostly easily accepted by the pu uh, public include private enterprise, uh, account of uh, 83%, and market economy account for 75%. <coughs> Now, this just shows the how to accept presented the words, uh, the selected words, uh, or message of liberty. Uh, it clearly shows that the words with high rate of the how to upset by the public included private ownership, uh, capitalism, and freedom of choice. 
Now I'm going to talk about the confident level of journal uh, journalists overuse of the word machine at work. Uh, the term that is received the highest percentage of confidence as market economy, private enterprise, free trade, free market. The term that uh, get highest trend of unconfident of the journalist compound private ownership, market morality, rule law, etc. So, uh, uh, you, can, you can begin from that, from the chance that the journalist who acquire the background in economic have much more confidence in its use of free market related term and work than journalists uh, who have the background in journalism or foreign language. This chart indicates that journalists who are currently in the working in the, uh, on the online newspaper tend to be more confident than people who are working in print newspaper. Uh, it can be assumed from this chart, this picture, that level of confidence of younger journalists is higher than confidence level of uh, older ones. <coughs> Journalists uh, who age read from 20 to 29 tend to be most confident. Now I'm going to concentrate on the finding from the focus, uh, focus group. What would message of the journalist see as positive? Uh, private enterprise and market economy as both considered as Easier, easily accepted by the public and confidently used by journalists. Free market and free trade are also confidently practiced by journalists. The group of journalists last attend on or all the following characteristics as uh, economics, background, working for online newspaper, which <coughs> in 2029. Now, the what, what and message the journalists see as a negative, hardly accepted by the public or unconfidentially practiced by journalists, conspire cons individual liberty, freedom of choice, uh, private ownership, capitalism, and rule of law, market and morality. Uh, remarkably, <coughs> there are uh, three of six about terms that refer to human rights as following <coughs> individual liberty, freedom of choice, private ownership, the uh, three remaining terms which each right trade of the specified regime has not been largely acknowledged but is capitalist, no group, law and markets more related. Now <coughs> we are also finding the major factor that affect journalist confidence. Uh, journalists that both have a free degree in economic and are working in online newspaper agency has tendency to be more confident than journalists that have a background in journalism or uh, foreign language or uh, are employed by a free newspaper agency. It also plays an important role in deciding journalist uh, level confidence. Young journalists age from 20 to 29 quite higher high each level of confidence amongst police of all age. There will be some lesson drawing from the doing focus group. Um, as, as you know, this is the first time that the focus group uh, was done in Vietnam. In order to promote the liberty idea in the country, it's, it's uh, very important to, to learn what the uh, language and ask what's at best to be able to talk about uh, freedom in a way that people uh, are most likely to, lash, to listen. From that media, worker and journalists would 
chosen to be the focal uh, group participant. The result from the focal group really helped to understand and find su suitable way to promote the idea of liberty, uh, use more of the positive, uh, positive words, and avoid negative one in uh, our article and our paper. Now we are doing the uh, organizing summer school on market economy for student journalists and holding seminar based at the Sharia printing brand, uh, branded as a Sharia printing circle for university students publishing book on free markets, etc. Uh, here is a, is a some of the book we are. We are uh, <coughs> published as the Vietnamese version of the after the welfare, and this is the Vietnamese version of the morality of capitalism. We are published in Vietnam. Okay, that's then my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. is going to be by Casey Larty telling us about uh, the study that they did in South Korea. That's not it. Okay. okay, anyway, I do know my name is Casey Larty, and I am the director for international relations at Freedom Factory Company in Seoul. And we are attempting to have a for profit. And everyone always asks us, how are you going to make money? And I always say, ask in return, can you give me some suggestions? Because we are still trying to figure that out, but we're trying. Uh, I'm also a fellow with the Actors Network, and I do a couple of other things, and so that I'll mention briefly. Okay, so okay, so we do a couple of things. One is private property rights. Second, consumer rights watch. Third, monitor what they're doing over at the National Assembly. And fourth, the main part that I work on is North Korean liberation. Hey, our founder is Kim Chung Ho. He is a professor at Yonsei University, and some of you may know he is also known as the Freedom Rapper. And he will rap live on stage. He's done concerts, all those kinds of things. And we actually did a rap video together a couple of years ago. We're always looking for ways to spread the message, always trying to do something different and to be creative with it. Uh, and right now he's doing a series of lectures about the history of entrepreneurs in South Korea. And every week he would dress up as a different either character or some different age in South Korea. And, uh, and also his co-host is here, Sodam Jung. She flew here from uh, South Korea to participate. They do the sessions. Oh, she's taking a photo right now, by the way. Uh, so they're, they're doing creative, fun, fun things. And again, we're always trying to find ways to reach out to people to spread the message of liberty. Okay, and we also have a TV podcast. I'm the co-host of it. And my co-host is a North Korean refugee. She'll be here soon and we'll be doing the TV show later on today. And again, this is a, just another way, another way to reach out to people. And we also have a special program that I'm in charge of. It's called the Teach North Korean Refugees Project. And my co-director is here. She also flew here on her own money. The two of them just wanted to come and join uh, the session. And we've matched 110 refugees with 110 volunteer English teachers. So it's a really great program. And we've had a couple of stars come out of the program also. And we have a session every month. It's always a wonderful thing. So reaching out to people directly. Uh, so when you're spreading your message, you also need to show some action along with it. Okay, so as background of Korea, when you talk about spreading the message of liberty, uh, there is some history, as some others have referred to, this baggage. In the case of Korea, most of the last, well, for more than 500 years, it was ruled by a dynasty of kings who controlled the country. And there were four classes within Korea. So at the top, you have the academics or the scholars. Second, you have, so that's why Koreans are still crazy about education today. We do anything uh, to make sure that children get educated. Second, you have farmers. And farmers to today, just like in I don't know, France and some other countries, are still considered to be a protected class. So when you talk about free trade agreements and opening the country, it's considered a threat to those people. Uh, then you have craftsmen, people who are just making things. And then at the bottom, the low of the low, 
the lowest and there's no name that you could use to curse them that people would get upset with because they were considered to be the worst people. Uh, they had to have permission of the king in order to do business and um, yeah, and most professions were prohibited. So when you talk about the history of Korea, the merchants are at the bottom. So anything about business was always considered to be something negative. So then after the kings uh, were kicked out, next you had the Japanese take over. And then the Japanese were seen as being capitalists. So again, you had a negative um, uh, association with the, with the word because of what was going on in Korea. And a lot of the leading activists were communists. So they were considered to be the heroes and the capitalists were considered to be the bad guys. And then there was a poll that was done after Korea was liberated in 1945 in August. 8,400 South Koreans were surveyed by the U.S. military uh, about which direction would they like the country to go in. 70% said they supported socialism. Now this is South Korea, not North Korea. Okay? Talking about South Korea, 70% supported socialism, 14% 14 supported communism, okay? the that is, 7% supported capitalism, and 9% supported other, which is probably just execute all the other people. <laughs> There's a lot of fighting going on at that time. Okay, so the first president of South Korea, Sigma Nhi, he took over and he tried democracy and capitalism, but he was a dictator. So again, whatever is associated with capitalism is considered to be a negative thing. Uh, so the economy was in chaos, you had a war going on, and of course people love the democracy part that he talked about that he would get to eventually, uh, but they didn't like the part about capitalism. And then the country was taken over by a dictator, Park Chung-hee, military leader, and he forced freedom on South Korea. So he had a culture that was basically socialist, I mean, Confucianism, I mean, basically it's like a socialist uh, society. Uh, he opened up free trade for the first time in history. You're going to export, we're going to build a mighty, mighty nation. But he also locked up people, executed people. So a lot of people cannot forgive him for that. So again, you had like the brutal dictator who also said this country will become developed. Okay, so if you look at the history, it's all been bad news whenever Koreans encounter any form of capitalism, uh, all the way to the 1980s with the dictators and then resistance, as I said, to market openings and resistance to free trade agreements. So that's the history. So today, where is the polarized country about ideology? Very strongly so. So the one that, I just want to point out the one that the, the guy in the bottom with his mouth wide open, he's the one who set up the canister in the National Assembly of tear gas to block the vote on the free trade agreement. To, to protect the farmers and to protect other interest groups within the country. Okay, so we come to today, we talk about freedom, we talk about capitalism, we talk about liberty, those things. And so we came up with 18 different words. Okay, let me say that my colleague, Eugene Lee, actually did the focus groups. I'm just a pretty face here to present. And she couldn't be here. Uh, so capitalism, survival of the fittest, jungle capitalism, excessive competition. So we came up with the 18 dirty words um, in Korea, including chaebol, uh, letter I, which means large conglomerate. So we came up with these 18 different for, uh, words and decided to test them on people. And But the way we did it is by also offering alternative words that could be more pleasing to people. Uh, so for example, for capitalism, instead use market economy. For chaebols, the, the hated big companies, just use large con conglomerate. For libertarianism, uh, pure liberalism, uh, instead of using progressive down at the bottom, use left. So we're curious how would people respond to these things. Okay. So uh, I'll just show you what she came up with, which is not so easy to understand. So I, I had to break it down a little. But I'll just show you that she did this. We can go back to it later if anybody is desperate to do it, which I hope no one is. Um, okay. So capitalism, market economy. How do Koreans respond? Well, actually, and, and the way she did it, uh, where it says original word, she did it on a um, zero to twenty scale. And on one side is negative, disagree. On the other side is positive, and they like it. And then. 
with market economy, she did from zero to 100. So this one, actually people were somewhat positive when they um, were told the word capitalism, and they were fine with using market economy instead. So viral the fittest is an interesting one because I mean, it's a phrase that I think a lot of people, at least in the West, will say, okay, we don't use that anymore. Well, the libertarians in South Korea are not afraid to use that phrase. And they think it's better to stick with that word instead of using something like harmony capitalism. But if you look at others, so uh, conservatives and others, mainly many progressives, uh, they are supportive of using the other phrase, uh, harmony capitalism. And then excessive competition. So there, across the board, people had a negative response to that phrase. And instead, market capitalism, just across the board, they're all saying this is a great thing. Winner take all, again, in the West, people will be like, OK, that doesn't sound that good. And in Asia, sorry, in Korea, also the same kind of response. Don't use that word. Instead, use consumer choice capitalism. Again, across the board, people were supportive of that. Uh, trade protectionism. Now, this one, the libertarians in South Korea are saying don't use that word. Instead, it's better to use regulation of trade. And with progressives, they actually were somewhat supportive of using trade protectionism and against the phrase regulation of trade. So I think we should use regulation of trade. That is my conclusion. All right. uh, then Chebo. Uh, again, the large companies within South Korea. So most people were saying that, okay, it's, it's okay. Um, but conservatives in particular would prefer to use large conglomerate, and I think because they are more associated with the chain so they're tired of being associated with that. And then just a couple of more to finish. Uh, the original word libertarianism, now this one is funny because even libertarians in South Korea are saying we don't really like that word. Okay? So instead, and they're gung-ho for using uh, pure liberalism instead of libertarianism. And, and the reason is that there is no word libertarianism in South Korea, and it's hard to even translate it. It's like a really awkward phrase uh, when it is used. So that could be part of it. And conservatives are also supportive of it. Uh, progressives, as you can guess, don't like that word. Uh, and then the last one is progressive. And this one, there's a clear divide. So you have the libertarians and conservatives saying that they like that word. Uh, I'm sorry, they, like, they prefer to use the word left. They don't want to use the word progressive, but the progressives are saying, oh, no, 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 don't use left. We are progressives. So there's a clear divide about using that word. So again, we're going to try to tag it on uh, there. And uh, a couple of words were recommended by some of the people in the focus groups. Um, so, and we ended up using some of them. And then, OK, that's it. OK, I know I got to up to, uh, to questions. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll start. Actually, uh, if you have the microphone, start over, we're going to take the first question over here from the left. I have a question, Patricia. Uh, you said that you are much more successful in promoting the ideas of liberty and capitalism with the Chinese than with the Malays. And I'm astonished how this can happen. Looking to the cultural background of the Chinese, I think of persons like the Buddha, of Bodhisattvas, of Ahabs. And as far as I know, none of them ever tried their hand in business and none of them ever succeeded. By contrast, the Malays are Muslims. And as far as I know, Muhammad has been the only commercially enlightened prophet in human history because he was a successful businessman. Why don't you make more of that in selling capitalism and free market to Malays? I think if you try to promoting capitalism this day, then promoting capitalism would be the road of following the example of the prophet who for Muslims must be the most perfect human being in history. So I'm really puzzled of why you do not succeed with Malays. Thank you. 
Thank you for that question. Um, I think the response to that is that the Malaysian um, ethno-religious political debate that's taking place um, has a deep history. So it's not so much about religion as it does about uh, as it is about economic rights of the majority Malay that does not feel they have been protected. Or rather, the sentiment today in Malaysia is that um, the minority Chinese has, uh, has... Okay, the narrative is this, and, and this is not a narrative that I agree with, but the narrative is this, that the traders, meaning the Chinese, were allowed to come into Malaysia, were given citizenship for free, and as a result of that, has taken over the majority of, of economic property in Malaysia. Um, and so, in the last few years especially, we've actually seen the rise of these um, ethnic sup supremacists um, who have called for the non-Malays to get out of the country. And this is, this is a, a, I'm not saying that it's a prevalent view, but it is a minority view that is gaining ground. Um, so it's a lot more to do with, with economics and uh, with the perception that they have not been able to elevate themselves out of poverty relative to their counterparts among the non-Malays. Um, and because of this race, ra racial scheme that's going on, uh, religion is just added as an additional layer on top. Um, if you know Malaysia, in Malaysia, all Malays are born as Muslims and uh, it's very difficult for them to leave the religion. Uh, so, in the past, Islam has been... Um, in, in the past, the political group being one of more of an ethno-political um, theme. So, in, in response to that, I think you're right that it would be great if we were to use um, the example of the Prophet who did in the past engage in business. Um, but it's not something that would sell today because uh, the, the, the Malay majority would actually say, um, you're taking our interests away. And uh, the constitution defends that special position of the Malays. Uh, they have exacerbated that special position that's guaranteed in the constitution to becoming what is now a right that cannot be taken away from them. It's a right. Um, it, it's, it's almost as if it's a fundamental human right that they elevate themselves as uh, in a position and a status that's above the others. But again, let's, this is... Let's just wrap up so we can get some more questions. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So, so, so the view is, is that, and there are moderate Malays out there who are trying to counter this view, but it's, it's fairly complex. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, excellent presentation and work uh, here. And um, my question is about North Korea. I just visited North Korea a few months ago, and it was horrified. And um, uh, also, Venezuela invited North Korea to open a new embassy in Caracas, so I'm even more horrified. <laughs> so tell me what, what you think about reunification of Korea, when, how, and uh, if possible. Okay. Actually, I don't talk about it. <laughs> no, and so the reason is that it's something that very few people can do anything about. And what I try to encourage people is to think first about some practical action that you can take where you are today. And unless you've been invited to like six party talks or reunification discussions, you are not going to have an impact on things. So, so my suggestion is start where you are and build from there and see if you can have an impact. And so, so, so I don't talk about it. And in fact, I have a rule whenever I have a discussion that I only allow one question about reunification <laughs> because it, it has hijacked so many discussions within South Korea and in the end, people, no one could do anything about it. And I'll so, say that it's a little bit off topic for this one and, and Casey can talk and we'll have a chance later during the, uh, the television program that we're broadcasting with Casey to talk more about what can be done in, in North Korea. So let's take a few more questions really pertinent to um, the topic at hand here. Uh, I just want to add for one very simple question to all of you. Uh, in a simple uh, correlation, when you take a look at the strong governance versus uh, introduction of free markets in the, in the economies, 
I want to take an example of, let's say, Korea with General Park, who was a very strong leader. When you take, let's say, in China, Deng Xiaoping, he was again a very strong leader, introduced uh, a significant reform in the country. Uh, Singapore has a very strong leadership since its inception, became a very successful model. Uh, and, and, and I think the model all around applies very well to Asia. And, and you take a look at the other case, like India, when you have so many different, different political factions, very hard to, to reach a, a very meaningful, meaningful decisions. So I, I want to ask you, what is the perception? How do you see uh, democracy as part of liberalism or libertarianism uh, in Asia? And whether you make a difference between liberalism and libertarianism? These are, two, in my opinion, these two different concepts. Okay, I, I want to just address part of it, not, not all of that. Uh, William Easterly did a paper, I guess about a year or so ago, Benevolent Autocrats. And what he did, he showed that people will pick a handful of examples, the ones that you just listed, and say, Here's, here are some good examples of powerful leadership. Now, he did the analysis of 89 different countries like this and found that nine of them can be considered to be success stories. Ten of them, absolute failures. 70 of them just in the middle where there's some growth, positive and negative, but that people are basically cherry picking like the handful of examples. So that we need to keep in mind that, okay, nine successes, 10 failures, it's like a wash is the point. And then he looked at 13 different democracies and said that one of them, Japan, again, has had the long-term growth. Again, people dispute whether or not it's there. And then 12 of them, some negative and positive. So I guess I want to remind people that, yes, it can happen. It can be a success story. But it's just as likely that it can be a complete disaster. We have for one more question. I think we're actually going to go to Parth Shah. Um, if, if, we can, uh, if you can bring the microphone over to Park, whose group, uh, Center for Civil Society, also um, was engaged in this focus group project that Atlas commissioned. Yes, I just want to share one learning from that project. Uh, it's not so much a question, uh, but that's, I think, answers part of what uh, uh, Tusia raised in the beginning. So we asked the question about capitalism, and what we found that the image that goes with the word makes the most difference. So when we projected the word capitalism with the image of Coke, and McDonald, the high proportion of people had a negative impression of that. When we changed the image, and the same word, the image of a local sort of vendor, and local fast food chain, which has come up in India in the last uh, few years, and the image was uh, changed their, uh, their sort of view of the town. So I think one learning that we have is that we do work on what images come to people's minds when they hear particular words. And that could change, not so much by changing the words themselves. Same thing happened in terms of economic freedom. So when we began to use the word economic freedom, quite a few people had a negative impression of it. So when we changed that to livelihood freedom, uh, that became a very positive word. So basically, economic freedom meant to them that economic freedom applies to those who have economic means, which obviously are rich people. We're talking about freedom of those people. When you said livelihood freedom, Basically, it means people who are in their livelihood. Obviously, those are not rich people. And therefore, they have a very positive impression of it. Very well said, Parth. Um, and I'll just maybe as a, as a follow up, I remember um, you know, Parth's groups and for civil society has been very active, um, as Tom said this morning, in uh, working with the entrepreneurs that have uh, put together very low cost um, private schools. And I remember when we first heard James Tooley talking about wanting to study this. When we saw this proposal to study private schools in India, we had the same reaction. It was like private schools, you know, that seemed that's for the elite. It wasn't what we were focusing on. And I know that part of all the communications now talk about is, is the phrasing like, independent budget schools, I think, as a way to talk about this uh, amazing phenomenon that um, all of us in this room would be so supportive of. Um, but again, like, uh, figuring out the language to promote it um, is, is so important to how we, whether we're going to succeed or not. Um, we are going to break for lunch. There's going to be a buffet, and I'll encourage you to uh, get your food, go back into the room where we started um, this morning, just adjacent to, to this one. Uh, we're going to add um, a couple uh, things to the presentation during lunch, so uh, please do uh, help me thank the, the panelists and then make your way to uh, get food, and we'll wait again.